Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It is a good morning indeed. You know why? Because it's Palm Sunday. Today is the day we commemorate Jesus' triumphant, triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Today is the day that kicks off what we traditionally call Passion or Holy Week. And today is the day that we will forever remember as the day Jesus proclaimed to the multitude that their king had finally arrived. Well, today is so special, and it is. And it was true that the long-awaited and prophesied Messiah had finally come to save his people, which he did. Then why is it that that same multitude who were praising his name one day and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, could then a few days later shout, crucify him, crucify him. We want Barabbas. Well, in order to understand why there was such a dramatic shift in the multitude's view of Christ, I want to read with you a few passages that not only recall Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, but also his sacrificial exit. Now, the account of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem is in all four Gospels. It's one of those events that's so important that all the writers needed it to get their message across. Now, if you didn't know, uh, each writer of each Gospel <laughs> wrote it in such a way that it appealed to a specific audience looking to promote certain ideas. For example, Matthew's gospel was written primarily to a Jewish audience in order to show them how this Jesus is the prophesied Messiah they had been reading and hearing about all their lives, which is why Matthew uses more Hebrew terms and Old Testament references than any other gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, since it's written to Jews, it opens up with the genealogy of Jesus that I know everyone skips over. Yeah. Admit it. It's okay. It's understandable. Don't lie, though. You open up Matthew, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, if you're a truly devoted Christian, you may even make it to verse 2. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. And verse 3 is typically where people fall out because... That's where the hard to pronounce names start. So you just glance over that to the end, right? Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron and Hezron begot Ram, who begot Abinadab, who begot Nashon, who begot Salmon, begot, begot, begot. Okay, verse 18, an angel appears to Joseph. There we go. And it's okay. This is why the other gospels are written. See, this genealogy doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but lineage and genealogy was of first importance to the early Jew and Israelite. Yeah. It let them know that this coming Messiah, whoever he was, was coming from the line of David. So they paid special attention to stuff like that. I'm just kidding. Though. This is CBC. I know y'all read the whole Bible, including genealogy, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so Mark was written as more of a narrative or story with key events described, but not in detail. Mark opens up and gets right to the point. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written. I will send my messenger who will prepare your way. And then John comes, baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. See, quick, concise, and with a call of action. Repent, you sinner. He challenges us with a personal choice to have a relationship with this amazing Jesus. Sort of like a sermon. Now, Luke's gospel is very detailed and very specific of uh, the account of Jesus' life and ministry. Mm -hmm. He was writing to well-educated and somewhat unconvinced Greeks who needed all the facts before making their decision. Now Luke, being written to the educated and sophisticated, makes that known immediately by his writing style. Inasmuch, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to them. It seemed good to me also, having perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Translation for those who, like me, are a little less sophisticated. Luke investigated the matters of Christ himself because he wanted a more in-depth and detailed gospel account and according to himself, was the best man for the job since he had perfect understanding of all things. Now John, on the other hand, is altogether different from the other, uh, the other three. 
It isn't written as some kind of apologetic work to convince or persuade people to turn from their religion or belief to Christianity. No, instead, it's written as a devotional, displaying and describing the love of God for his creation by way of his son, Jesus Christ. It opens up with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him, Nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was a light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John goes on to give us the most recognizable and popular verse about the love of God that nearly all Christians have memorized. That's right. John 3.16, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. It's for this reason that I chose to use John's account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Now, for those who may not be entirely familiar with what happened on Palm Sunday, turn with me, if you will, to John 12, starting at verse 12, to get a refresher for us. After, we will get into the shift in perception and why. I'll give you all a second just to get there. <clears throat> okay. So starting at verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to, to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So let's break this down. <clears throat> Verses 12 and 13. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they had heard that this Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. So not only was there a multitude that followed Jesus from Bethany when he raised Lazarus from the dead, but there was also 2.5 to 3 million people already in Jerusalem for the upcoming feast of Passover. No doubt they had all heard of this man, Jesus, who was performing all these wonderful works and miracles and were intrigued by the possibility that the Messiah they had been waiting for must have arrived. I mean, if someone can raise somebody from the dead, then he must be the king of the Israelites, right? Therefore, they greet this Jesus and potential king as they would any, as they would greet any great king, as a victor from a war or crusade. And for example, in Greco-Roman culture, which is what Jerusalem was at the time, it was customary for the king to ride in on the grandest of horses to be met with palm branches, which signified victory over one's enemies. In uh, Grecian sports, actually, uh, the winner was given a palm branch, and in Roman war, the palm leaf itself was victory personified. In fact, Victoria was the Roman goddess of victory. So you can see how the multitude viewed their potential king. They were eagerly anticipating this grand entrance by a man who could save them from their current political troubles. They even called out to him, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, this is actually an Old Testament psalm that they were quoting here. And anytime an Old Testament scripture is referenced, you should always go back and read the chapter to apply what I call the 1010 rule. Uh, now, the 1010 rule is foundational for biblical interpretation. You always want to read 10 verses above and then 10 verses below the scripture you're focusing in on to make sure that you get the full context of what's being said. So turn with me, if you will, to uh, Psalm 18, and we're going to read that in its entirety so I can show you something. Psalm 118. Now, the title of this psalm is, uh, it says, Praise to God for His Everlasting Mercy. <clears throat> and it starts, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his mercy endures forever. And let those who fear the Lord now say his mercy endures forever. 
I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surround me. Yes, they surround me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surround me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You push me violently that I may fall, but the Lord has helped me. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tent of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our, in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, this is the verse that John uh, made reference to. Say now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. So what kind of feeling do you get from this song? Uh, it sounds like to me that the author was in a bad spot because of the nations in charge and began calling out to the Lord to destroy his enemies. He's pleading with God. God, save me now. Defeat my enemies. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is what the multitude was chanting as Jesus entered. Hosanna, which means save now. Blessed are you since you come on God's behalf. See, the multitude was looking for immediate prosperity. And they thought Jesus, if he were the real Messiah and King, would grant them that prosperity by destroying Rome, their enemies. But that's not what Jesus was there to do, was it? That was their will, not thy will. So let's keep reading. Verse 14 and 15. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, there's another Old Testament reference, so you know what that means, right? Yep, we got to go back to Zechariah to see why John referenced this one. So, Zechariah 9. And again, we're going to read the chapter because he specifies a certain portion of this, but there's things he says before and after that are really applicable to help understand so Zechariah 9 starting at verse 1 says the burden of the word of the Lord against the land of uh, Hadrach and Damascus its resting place for the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord also against a map which borders on it and against Tyre and Sidon though they are very wise for Tyre built herself on a towel heap, tower heaped up silver like the dust and gold like the mire of the streets behold the Lord would cast her out he will destroy her power in the seas, and she will be devoured by fire. Ashkelon shall see it in fear. Gaza also shall be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for he dried, her, dried up her expectation. The king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. A mixed race shall settle in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. I will take away the blood from his mouth and the abominations from between his teeth. But he who remains, even he, shall be for our God, and shall be like a leader in Judah and Ekron like a Jebusite. And I will camp around my house because of the army, because of him who passes by and him who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them. Now I have seen with my eyes. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. And this is the part John was referencing. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, <laughs> The battle bow shall be cut off. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I will declare that I will restore double to you. For I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, 
and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like the sword of mighty men. Then the Lord will be seen over them, and his arrow will go, will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with whirlwinds from the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them. They shall devour and subdue with sling stones. They shall drink and roar as if with wine. They shall be filled with blood like basins, like the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them in that day as the flocks of his people, for they shall be like the jewels of a crown, lifted like a banner over his head. For how great is its goodness and how great its beauties. Grain shall make the young men thrive and new wine the young women. So sort of the same feel as Psalm 18, right? This is a prophetic scripture about Israel reigning victorious over its enemies. And after he leads his people to victory, their king brings peace to their city. That's why he rides in on a donkey to symbolize peace. See, the multitude saw Jesus riding in on a donkey, just as Zechariah prophesied. So they assumed what you and I would assume. Our king is finally here. Psalm 18 says that he's going to save us now and bring prosperity by defeating our enemies. And Zechariah says we will recognize him by the donkey he rides in on, the symbol of peace. What a glorious day. No more Rome. No more Caesar. Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, who's going to save us from this tyranny and lay waste to our enemies. But see, his ways are not our ways. Right. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways and thoughts higher than ours. Mm -hmm. Not even his apostles fully understood the true mission of Jesus Christ. We see this in verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. You can read this in Luke's account, chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Um, Jesus sat them down, opened up their scriptures, uh, which was the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, and explained to them how they were all about him. Then he ascended to the Father to take his rightful place on the throne of God, having victory over the true enemies, which were sin and death, and the devil, and the principalities, and the powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this age, and the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, Jesus' mission was not to overthrow the temporary earthly rule of Rome. No, it was to overthrow the eternal stronghold of death by way of sin caused by Adam and Eve many years ago in the garden. This is why in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, Jesus says after his resurrection and glorification that all authority on he in heaven and on earth has been given to him. So go therefore and preach this good news, this gospel, this story of victory to all nations on earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the remission of their sins and proclaiming their victory over death. And then teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. If you do that, Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So how, with this good news, did the multitude then turn on Jesus? How are they shouting Hosanna on Sunday and then shouting crucify him on Friday? How could they go from wanting to place on his head a crown of gold and jewels to a crown of thorns? Verse 17 through 19 says, Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, that's important. For this reason, the people, the multitude already in Jerusalem for the Passover, also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look how the world has gone after him, which means all the scheming and slandering they did about Jesus meant nothing. All the work they did to prevent this Jesus from gaining followers accomplished nothing because the multitude was still completely bought in to Jesus. As long as he conformed to what they thought Jesus should be. And we see this far too often in our world today. Matter of fact, we were just talking about this in, in men's Bible study last week. If you turn on your TV or look on social media, we live in a Christian America. Watch a music awards show sometime. An artist will go up on stage wearing next to nothing and accept an award for writing a song about sexual immorality, and then have the audacity to thank Jesus for making it all possible. The Jesus I know, 
The Jesus from the Bible rain down sulfur on an entire city for doing exactly what they're saying about. Now look at Facebook. I, I know you've probably seen the slogans, right? Um, how's it go? Uh, love is love and, and true love and Jesus is love so he approves of my relationship. No. The book says you love God by keeping his commandments. You mean there's rules to love? You can have it. You see that? Hosanna to crucify him. You know what that is? That's idolatry. They are worshiping a false god created by their own idea of what they think he should be. Amen. God says in Genesis 1 and 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. But today, this Christian America wants to rewrite God's word to say, let me make God in my image. Mm -hmm. They want a Jesus that will bend to their will instead of the other way around. And if this Jesus doesn't conform to their idea of what they think that he should be, they will go from Hosanna to crucify him real quick. That's right. that's right. And that's what happened in Jerusalem. On Sunday, they saw their king, who raises people from the dead, entering in on a donkey. They were ready to take up arms and overthrow the Romans with Jesus as their leader. But instead of attacking the Romans, the first place Jesus went to was their very own temple. He started flipping over tables and accusing their own religious leaders of turning the house of God into a den of thieves. Wait a minute, they must have thought. You're supposed to be attacking the Romans. Well, surely this Jesus must address the high taxes demanded by Caesar then. Psalm 18 said the Messiah will prosper us now. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Well, surely this Jesus will give us control of our own city. Zechariah says that we will be given double, so we must just be cleaning out the city to make it bigger and better. Take a good look at these monumental buildings. Not one stone will be left on another. What? Well, surely Jesus will bring peace. I mean, he rode in on a donkey. Do not think I have come to bring peace. Get a sword. So he's rebuking our entire religion. He's telling us to obey the laws of Rome. He's predicting the destruction of our most sacred temples. And he's telling us peace isn't what he's come to bring. This is not the Messiah I created in my image. He must be a false king. Hand this guy over to, uh, to Pilate. And better yet, give us Barabbas. Give us a sinner who steals just like us. Give us a sinner who lies. And give us a sinner who cheats so that we won't feel like we're the ones who are in the wrong. You see, the multitude wanted a Messiah, but they wanted one that would accomplish their will. Now, if you were here on Sunday to hear Brian Arnold, number one, you were blessed because... What an amazing time that was. But two, you might remember a message that he brought about the will of God in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And this is the part we need to focus on because this is the part that the multitude forgot. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Thy will, not my will. Don't make an idolater out of yourself by molding a God in your image. When you set your mind on the things of the world, you will be conformed to the things of the world. But see, we're not of this world. Jesus says in John 18 that his, uh, that his kingdom that is in the Lord's prayer that is to come is not of this world. Paul says in Philippians that if we walk by the same mind of Christ, then we are Christ and citizens in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't be conformed to this world. If you have been raised with Christ claiming true victory over the real enemies which are not flesh and blood, then seek those things which are above where Christ is. Set your mind on those things and not the things of the earth where all is temporary. So to close, as we remember Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem as our Savior and King on this Palm Sunday, let us also remember that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. We may have an idea of what we think peace and prosperity are, but that doesn't mean Jesus sees it the same way. If you want to know what Jesus' way is, I have a solution for you. The Bible says to be in prayer about everything with supplication and thanksgiving, to let your request be made known to God. Now, if he gives you what you ask for, 
you know that you were in line with God's will. If not, you know that that's not what he has planned for you. Now that may be a hard pill to swallow, but remember, his ways are not our ways. But he does work all things together for the good of those who love him. So he has something better than what you wanted in store for you. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Keep this in the forefront of your mind so you will always remember that it's not my will, but thy will. Thank you.